All right, good afternoon, folks. Kind of just wanted to give a quick update to our YouTube audience on some of the things that we've been <laughs> highlighting, focusing on, talking about within the uh, phenomgroup.com trading room. We have a live uh, trading room where we are engaged with our members, watching how the markets perform uh, throughout the entirety of the trading day. We pretty much kick off things with our uh, pre-market setup conversation, looking at you know some of the broader market and economic trends, uh, looking at economic data, looking at various uh, equity market as well as credit market uh, indicators, kind of give us a gauge, a lay of the land, so to speak, with respect to what we may encounter during the trading session itself. Um, so, you know, I, this has probably been beaten to, you know, to death, uh, but GameStop. Bed Bath and Beyond, right? Um, Blackberry, Fubo, uh, Beyond Meat. Some of these names have just had meteoric moves um, over the last couple of weeks, if not, you know, going back a couple months now. But the the real barn burner moves have been since pretty much last week. Uh, GameStop today, ridiculous. Look at this candle, folks. You can't even really see it. You look at the one day chart here. Um, and it was up, I think, 120, 130% at the highs of the day. I, I mean, it was just astonishing. I, I think it got close to 100. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, yeah, almost $160 here. I mean, just, just crazy move here today. And then it completely collapsed completely collapsed here, finished the day up 76. I think it had two separate or maybe even three um, halting of the stock during the course of the trading day. Um, I want to focus more. I don't really participate in game stock. That's been a, you know, just a losing battle for, you know, the better part of a decade. It's a troubled company. It's on its path to bankruptcy, but it's one of those retailers where, just like most retailers that are national and have a large retail footprint, um, it takes a long time, long time to actually get to bankruptcy. Perfect example, Sears Holdings, and the more recent, JCPenney. I mean, JCPenney has been on its way to bankruptcy now for, I don't know, a good 10 years, and then finally, right? You know, here in uh, 2020, kind of the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will, uh, was the COVID or, you know, last year was uh, COVID-19. Um, COVID so, and JCPenney is, you know, in bankruptcy. But Bed Bath & Beyond is on the same path. What are you talking about, Seth? I, I mean, it, you know, it's, it has a, a lot better footing than JCPenney or Sears. And yeah, you make a good point. I didn't say it was going into bankruptcy tomorrow. Um, but it is. Make no mistake about it. This retailer is on the path to bankruptcy. Macy's, on the path to bankruptcy. Kohl's, on the path to bankruptcy. Nordstrom's, I mean, you're talking about a company, Nordstrom's in uh, last year, if not the beginning of this year, trying to privatize. Why? Because they know their situation is dire. They've seen their sales trend and gross margin performance over the last several years. There's no hope for some of these department store retailers, let alone home goods specialty retailers. I mean, the business model just doesn't work. It hasn't worked for a number of years. Bed Bath & Beyond was $76 a share in 2015. How do I know I own restricted stock from consulting work that I did uh, for Bed Bath & Beyond going back to like 2005, 2006? You know, they gave me the stock at $25 a share. 2015, I'm writing articles and I'm analyzing the stock. Uh, you know, I'm a sell side analyst for Capital Ladder Advisory Group. And I'm like, this is a disaster in the making. All you have to do is look at gross profit margins. Uh, I used to be a writer at uh, Seeking Alpha. And that's what I did. By 2016, I was telling people, just stay the hell away from this company. This is a bad situation here with a CEO that's going nowhere. The former CEO is Steve Tamaris. And the owners, for whatever, I should say the founders, for whatever reason, they would not get rid of this guy. He finally, finally got out of the picture, I think, in late 2018, early 2019. Finally, after like a decade of this guy just, just watching. Oh, I can't say watching. Look, the guy tried everything that he could. I, I, you know, I acquiesce to the idea that some of these, you know, retail operators 
are doing the things that they should do. Macy's is doing what it should do. They're trying all these different initiatives. Kohl's, all these different initiatives and partnerships with Amazon Prime and you can do your return. It doesn't mean anything. Hey, where's the marketing message around these initiatives? It doesn't exist. You know, you got Bed Bath & Beyond now is going to cut 200 stores. It's 20% of the entire store base. It's having a liquidation sale. It's selling every brand that basically does not have the Bed Bath & Beyond label. Cost Plus World Markets, it got like 200 stores across the nation. They bought that only a couple years ago. And I think in like two to three years, now they're selling it. Personalizationmall.com, they bought about two years ago as well. They've already sold that. Christmas tree shops, they've owned since forever. And they've sold those. This is a fire sale. And when I see Jim Cramer come on CNBC talk, well, Bed Bath & Beyond is doing okay. Really? In what world do you live that a company that is selling off all of his other brands, closing 200 plus stores over the course of 2021, they closed a few stores at the end of uh, 2020, in what way is that a retail that's doing okay? Oh, well, I, like, I, I love Mark Triton. He's from Target, so he must. I know Mark Triton. I'm not saying the guy's a bad guy. He's a good guy. I worked for Target for nine plus years. He ain't the guy. Any more than the, the lady that they hired to turn around JCPenney just a few years ago from uh, Jill, I forget her name, forgive me. Uh, but she basically came from Joanne Fabrics. Joanne Fabrics. Like in what world do, do people live in that they think a person that came from Joe, which is basically Michael's, it's an arts and craft retailer around the country. Um, in what world does she have the understanding and know-how to turn around an 800 store chain of clothing, apparel, accessories, makeup, blah, blah, blah. How does that connect? Where do you connect the dots between arts and crafts? Like we are different, we are dealing with two different, uh, you know, customer bases. We are different, dealing with two different uh, product assortment uh, business models. And of course it didn't work. Of course it didn't work. It had no probability of working. And here we are now, well, you know, Jim Cramer saying, well, I like Mark Triton because he's from Target. That's really all it comes down to. Does Jim Cramer know it or what he did in the past for uh, Target? Absolutely not. But I tell you what, you work long enough at Target as I did, and you understand Target is not Bed Bath & Beyond. It's just not. You have a very niche category that you're dealing with. Bed Bath & Beyond has over three decades of alienating, you know, the Gen Xers and the millennials. How do you all of a sudden get this company to align with them? And again, I give Mark all that. He's doing things no different than what the former CEO of Bed Bath & Beyond was doing. Remember, when you hear these, well, we're, we're doing this initiative and we're, you know, we're focusing here and we're focusing there. If you can't scale it quickly enough, it ain't working. And if you can't message it to the consumer, it ain't going to work. That was one of the biggest problems. I mean, JCPenney did all the right things. It brought in different products. It changed the clothing assortment. It did private label. Uh, you know, it was trying to rebuild its brands, it, you know, better pricing, better promotional cadence and blah, blah. The problem is, you and I know that as investors, right? We, we follow the story, we follow the, the, the conference calls, the transcripts, the quarterly results, the financial media telling us they're doing this, that, and the other. The reality is though, you and I know this, the consumer doesn't know this. Where's the campaign? Where's the marketing message? The TV commercials that telling people that Bed Bath & Beyond no longer owns Cost Plus World Market and that they're raising all these capital. Where is it in the, in the TV commercials that Bed Bath & Beyond is now actually running percentage off sales in stores, right? These things don't exist. Where was it that, may, that uh, JCPenney was, was remodeling its stores? You know, they got, I think they got up to 500 stores remodeled across the nation from 2013 through maybe 2018, bringing in furniture, bringing in uh, draperies, bringing in appliances, so on and so forth, right? It, there was none. There was none, right? Because you can get to this level of depreciation, you know, in, the, in the, the bottom line and top line metrics, guess what? Your marketing budget has to be crunched as well. Bed Bath & Beyond has never done TV commercials. 
right? Their, their main advertising expense historically is that 20% coupon that you get in the mail. And that's what they're starting to better focus on the cadence of promotional events, right? What happened when JCPenney better focused on the cadence of promotional you know, events and advertising? They basically alienated the customers. You don't dictate the cadence of the promotional events to the customer. They dictate it to you. So when I see Jim Cramer and when I see Mark Triton talk about this in the conference call, you know, I read the transcript and I'm like, in what world do you live, Mark Triton, that you are going to dictate promotions and advertising as well as discounting events to the customer? They dictate to you. You either have the wherewithal to work with the customer or you don't, but you're not going to dictate these things for very long to the consumer. You're going to alienate them in the same way, you know, that uh, Ron Johnson, when he came in and won at every day low price and kind of eliminated all the banners throughout the stores at JCPenney. And you had to look on the back of the product to see what that everyday low price was, right? That was like one of the biggest debacles of all time. Guess what? Where did uh, Ron Johnson come from? Yep, that's right. He worked at Target as well, obviously before he worked at Apple, but he's an ex-Target, you know, um, uh, entrepreneur and, and alumni. That's the word I'm looking for, alumni. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, so bottom line here, folks, bottom line, you know, you see these things come out on you know, CNBC and these people talk about, well, I think it can turn around and, you know, the story will get better. When? When? Who's ever turned around? Which national chain store retailer of scale has ever turned around? Well, I'll, I'll, I'm going to make this really short. Best Buy. That's it. And what, how did they turn? They basically had to, you know, they also shrank their store footprint, but they also changed the business model. They increased the service aspect of the business and they added warranty, which is like a 100% profit margin. I'm, you know, elaborating or I'm hyperbolizing. But, you know, uh, warranties are extremely high profit margins. And then you add the service side of the business. And it's a very different Best Buy. How do you do that at Macy's when you couldn't do it at JCPenney? When you couldn't do it at service merchandise in the 1980s and 1990s? When you couldn't do it at Radio Shack, when you couldn't do it at Sears Holdings or you know, Sears Kmart, you couldn't do it at Toys R Us, you couldn't do it at the Sports Authority. Again, question, we can really only look to one you know, anomalistic business that has actually been able to turn around. Now it's up to Best Buy to actually show sustainability. But again, you know, this was a warning I had issued on Bed Bath & Beyond way back in 2016, folks. And this wasn't the last one. I wrote about Bed Bath & Beyond in many articles, whether it's on Seeking Alpha or TalkMarkets.com. All I had to do was look at the gross margin performance. This was just up to 2013 because I just got, it was pointless. Gross margins did nothing but decline from 2013 till they hit rock bottom last year at 32%, 32%. But this told me that whatever they were doing on the surface of the car, if you will, the, you know, above the hood of the car, was just masking the problems with sales. In other words, they had to increase, they were ever increasing the 20% the, the coupons or the take $5 off for every $15 you spend coupon. Why? Because that's what the consumer dictated, because that's where the boomers were. That's Bed Bath & Beyond's audience. They have since never been able to attach you know, their product assortment, their, their business model, or attract it to the millennial generation. You still, you can, and I'm not exaggerating, you can go into Bed Bath & Beyond at any point in day during the week and you'll see a lot of blue hairs. It just is the way it is. It hasn't changed, not with Mark Triton here yet. He's a year into his tenure. Nothing has gotten better. All they're doing is cut, 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 and selling assets. There's nothing okay about that situation. They're red flags. And again, 
you know, which retailer has ever been able to shrink to grow? That was the premise of this article that I wrote in 2016 on Macy's when they started their restructuring program. And I was wondering, yeah, but Starboard Investment Company says that the real estate is worth some $30 billion. My argument throughout this article was, look, nobody can shrink to grow. It's never happened. It's never happened. In the history of big box retailing, nobody has ever shrunk to grow. It's stupid. You're literally just cutting yourself off from different cities. You're, you're reducing your brand footprint. You're reducing your retail footprint. There's something wrong with your business model. You don't need to shrink the store count. You need to change what's in the store. Like what Target did some 30 years ago when they decided to go into grocery as a segment within their store, just like where Walmart superstores were starting to, to roll out across the country. It's not too late. The problem is ego. All of these retailers, there's never been an answer. Macy still doesn't have the answer. The companies cut almost 200 stores. They cut stores every single year. Sales continue to decline. Gross margins continue to wane. Nothing's improving by shrinking the store count at Macy's. Nothing ever improved from shrinking the store count at, 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 at JCPenney. All of these retailers, well, we're going to add this assortment, and we're going to add that assortment, and we're going to do private label, which is another one of my Triton's bright ideas, right? Because they're going to go into private label. I remember a headhunter calling me back in 2011 from Toys R Us. Hey, Seth, we really need an experienced logistics chain operator. You know, what do you think? And I remember interviewing in the big, you know, push <laughs> that this, this gentleman was, was offering to me was, we see a really big, you know, improvement that will come from Toys R Us doing private label toy branding. And I said to myself, well, I did say it out loud, which was kind of a turnoff during to in the interview. I can, you know, sense the whole tone of the interview changing. Um, but what I said was, how does that change the assortment in the store? Like, like, how do we get the customer in the store to appreciate that? And it, there was no real answer. You know, that, I'm sure we'll get into that in future interviews. For now, we just want to focus on, and I'm like, no, you're not going to get me into a future interview if you don't, you know, outline to me how this is survivable after you've already been in bankruptcy with the same business model, you're simply going to change and say, instead of Tyco, it's going to say Toys R Us. Yeah, I don't think so. Not for me. Have a great day. And so Mark Triton is literally, you know, he's promoting that as being, you know, some, some kind of safe haven um, uh, initiative for Bed Bath & Beyond moving to some private label. Of course, you're going to still see your, your national brands, but, but they're going to have some pockets within each department that are going to be private label. <laughs> Again, I've seen all this before. There's nothing in the Bed Bath & Beyond transcript this last quarterly release that I haven't seen, you know, back here or back here. Here, here was 2018. I did, uh, 2019, I did an interview on TD Network Live. You know, this was after the quarterly release, just after the quarterly release of Macy's. You know, and one of the questions that um, Oliver here, he was the, the host of the show, he says, yeah, but they're doing this and they're doing that. And I said, which company is not doing all these different things? Like, at what point do you even have the ability to differentiate what you're doing from what the competitors are doing, right? <laughs> I love this. Well, we're starting a buy online, pick up in store or buy online, pick up curbside. Who's not doing that? New to you, Bed Bath & Beyond, is not new to the rest of the retail landscape. Therefore, it's not new to the consumer. How are you differentiating yourself? They're not. It's old bag. It's old hack. Share price, I think, was in the, uh, in, the, in the upper 20s when I did this interview. And, of course, it fell all the way down to like $12 a share in the subsequent uh, you know, 12 months. I haven't been invited on since, <laughs> you know, nobody wants to hear truth. You know, the, this is the kind of passion that, you know, it, again, it really goes back to, we see these things on television. We, we think CNBC is about experts and they're really not, you know, we think they're taking the same risk that we are as investors and they're really not. All right. So 
quick segue here. So what's happened, right? What's happened with these names, GameStop, and here's Bed Bath & Beyond. Folks, it ain't fundamental. There's no fundamental reason that Bed Bath & Beyond is $31.50 a share when the company is expected to see a loss of more than a dollar share this year and is basically trading at the valuations. I mean, you're talking about a PE expansion that is just admirable. <laughs> You know, why can't Walmart get this kind of PE expansion, right? Or Costco. I mean, come on. It's, the company was earning almost $5 a share back in 2015, 2016. Four or $5 a share. It's going to take a dollar a loss now. It was earning more than $3 a share in 2017. It was trading in the 30s back then. It's trading in the 30s now, and it's going to lose a dollar per share. Yeah, but the market is a discounting mechanism. It's not discounting perfection over the next three years. And as the company is going to try and remodel some 450 stores by 2023. And yes, by the way, that's the forecast. 450 stores, which is basically a little more than half of the fleet over the next two, two three years. Like I said before, if you can't scale these things quickly enough, you're a dead stick. That's the other thing about initiatives. How quickly are these initiatives going to be completed? Three years ain't going to get it done. The stock's not pricing in, you know, future growth. It's getting caught up in this, this Reddit, you know, Wall Street betting crowd, just like GameStop, because they're targeting, they're targeting the high short interest names like GameStop at 138% short interest, like Bed Bath & Beyond at 66.62% short interest, like Fubo TV at 62%. I mean, Macy's has even gotten targeted recently. Dillard's is going crazy, 34% short interest. Uh, Nordstrom, Nordstrom is up almost, I think it was up like 150% coming into this week. Like, did something change in these business models? No, obviously not. You know, this is, this, is a new, this is a regime. We see these kind of regimes pop up in new bull markets, and they, they're very short-lived, right? I call them air pockets, where something anomalistic happens, and this is that anomaly where these folks on Reddit and Wall Street, their Wall Street betting site, and they're just targeting these short, high short interest names, and it's working. It's working. Can you imagine being the guy or the investor who was buying up here today as, as, as uh, GameStop rose to 140, 150, almost $160 a share, and now the stock is down here? That's the point about knowing fundamentals. Like, this is just, there's no risk management here. This is just following the crowd. This is that air pocket. When they talk about it, you know, is the market a bubble? No, the market's not a bubble. The market is a tire. It inflates and it deflates. But you can have these air pockets in the market that develop, you know, for periods of time until they mean revert. And GameStop will. Like, this is not a forever situation, folks. GameStop is not going to trade at these levels. You know, you're talking about a company that was $5 a share no more than four or five months ago. Like it didn't all of a sudden, you know, have this change in fundamental performance and completely revamp its business model. That is not what's happening here. This is just a trade. This is a, a targeted trade, you know, dedicated to drive short interest out of these particular stocks because they have such high short interest. It's a math equation and they figured out the math. Good on them. You know, the other aspect is when you see a, an environment like this, recognize that it's opportunity. It may not be everybody's opportunity, but when price change, you know, the rate of change in price is this robust. And more often than not, both parties are winning, the shorts and the longs. You, you know, if you were short GameStop, you know, at $15 a share coming into this particular situation, talk about your dollar cost average opportunity. Of course, you know, assuming it's no more than, you know, two, three, four percent of your portfolio. Imagine your dollar cost opportunity because you know this can't stay. This is not a forever situation.
And the company's not even issuing shares with this newfound you know, valuation. They know they can't. And here's the other thing, you haven't heard anything from the analysts in these particular stocks and you know why you haven't and you probably won't. Well, you might hear it from an analyst that has a very good relationship at his firm. But the sell side analysts need to keep their relationships with the firms that they're covering because they're trying to generate uh, research revenues and they're trying to the institutional clientele and they're trying to, you know, make markets for these companies, you know, to, to, drive, uh, to drive order flow and whatnot. Now, imagine you have a bad relationship with your boss at this firm. Like what? Your boss is just itching, you know, just itching to get rid of you for whatever reason whatever reason, and you're the, you're the sell side analyst covering Bed Bath & Beyond, and you saw today it went up to 45 plus dollars. Like, look at the position you're in. You wanna service your clients. You know it's not worth $45. It's not worth $30 a share. It's not worth $25 a share. But can you downgrade it and, and risk severing the relationship with Bed Bath & Beyond's investor relations team? Because they're not going to recommend your firm, you know, for, for research when, you know, people call in, institutions call in, and they want, you know, the latest sell-side research report. Bed Bath & Beyond is not going to look at Morgan Stanley and say, yeah, go to them if they just downgraded the stock. And now you're, you've just given your boss a good enough reason to let you go. Or you don't do anything. Think about that. You don't do anything. You just let the price action take care of itself and all of a sudden it collapses and damages a lot of the firm's you know, uh, clientele. Why didn't you tell us to get out? You're stuck between a rock and a hard place if you're the sell side analyst. Those are the main losers here because they can't do anything. They're, they're at risk from both sides of the equation. They're gonna risk the relationship with the, with the uh, company they're covering. They're gonna risk the relationship with the clientele of the firm they work for and possibly their job. Now, I've been a sell side analyst. I know how it works. So anyways, opportunity. All day long, it was shortened uh, shares of Bed Bath & Beyond. Well, yeah, it squeezed out. Yeah, it did. Pepper. You know, I'll do 100 shares here, 50 shares there, 200 shares there. When it really gets out of control, there's a 1,000 share locked, as it did today when it got above 40. The price action breeds opportunity. I think the most apt positioning, you know, from a disciplined standpoint, though, is always going to come from knowing the fundamentals and knowing the price will revert to those fundamentals. It's just a matter of when. So I do feel bad for the folks that are buying into this and following this momentum of, you know, what is, was is simply just a mathematical equation to drive shorts out because that will end and the price will revert. The people that were buying over 100, 120, 30, 40, 50 today, I feel for them because that, that's not discipline. The discipline is always to know those fundamentals, if not some of those technicals, but I wouldn't even rely on the technicals in this environment. There's no technical here that suggested we were gonna go parabolic in GameStop today. That doesn't exist. It's the fundamentals that should drive your long-term discipline when you see something going on like this. I'm not encouraging folks to go out there and short these names, that's not what I'm saying. But I am saying from a risk reward standpoint, and if we understand fundamental valuations and have respected them for the last hundred plus years in the market, that's not going to all of a sudden go away and forever. Stick to your disciplines, you'll do fine over time, folks. And again, this is Bed Bath & Beyond. Like, what are you buying here, folks? There's nothing good going on here. Year over year decline since 2016. Like, stop it. You're not turning this ship around. At best, you're going to jump over a low bar. From time to, you'll jump over a low bar. But sooner or later, investors are going to realize that low bar doesn't exist anymore. And now you're just stuck with how many more stores are you going to close? Right? Because you got to, you know, increase the growth. Where's the growth going to, you know, everybody with Bed Bath and Beyond. You know, right now, it's all about cut, cut, cut to drive 
you know, better cash flows, better gross margin, so on and so forth. But at some point you have to grow. And remember, retailers are not value to earnings. It's all about sales because that's how you understand a retailer's market share. That's all it ever was about with Amazon. It's not about the price to earnings. It was always about sales. They keep growing sales, they'll keep growing market share. And that's where we stand today, folks. So with that, thank you for joining me here. My name is Seth Golden, phenomgroup.com. Visit our website, check out our offerings and subscribe today.